This is Justin Pulitzer. This is my weekend review video for Sunday, June 5th, 2016. A lot to cover. Going to jump right in. As usual, I'll start off with the six market keys, flow into the seven Fed keys, although I've been commingling them so much lately because the markets are the Fed, basically. Healthy or not, that's kind of how it is. Then get into the major market indices and then some of the uh, big momentum stocks. And I have a couple of special requests to uh, top it off. So we had the uh, big jobs number on Friday. And it kind of wound up being not all that big of a uh, market moving event. There was an initial move down. And then uh, the market rebounded quite, um, quite well. Let's talk about where we are in terms of the VIX. I have proposed in past videos that I think we're in a period like this of more benign volatility with um, brief spike ups. You can see this period was similar. You had a couple of um, spikes up into the lower 20s. And that seems to be the case here. We had um, and a bit of an excess low here, the run up into the flash crash. And then since then, the tides of volatility have come in a bit with um, a bit of a flare up post. I've discussed that um, this period here had the potential to turn into a period of going from benign volatility to increased volatility, but the tides of fear seem to have receded quite a bit, and it broke the tra channel, and there have been now one, two, th I guess you can say, I count this as two, three, four now attempts to break back into the channel. All have been rejected quite miserably, and these last one, we are making some lower lows, um, Notable is this, though. The low here was 1304. The low here is 1290. So we are now getting into the lower end of the range. 1280 was kind of the low end here. I suspect that this is sort of a bit of an asymptotic relationship that you're not going to get much of a, a move below here just because there's always some demand for protection. But the... Um, it seems to be that the we're still in buy the dip mode, so to speak, meaning when you do get these uh, sell-offs, they're met with buyers. So I would assume that that is going to be the case um, until some specific levels are broken, and I'll discuss that um, momentarily. Um, so we did the VIX, the dollar, which is the um, which is a big key. You can see here we had this big run up here pull back, and then I've drawn in a, um, a range, if you will. And moves outside of the range have not been sustainable. We had a move back into the range. I think this had just gotten so overdone. I mean, look, look at how this came down. This was just like, it, it, just way overdone. I, I give the example often in my Periscope videos of the slingshot. If you pull a slingshot back far enough, you'll get a you know a pretty far move. And this basically came up to look where the volume distribution is. It doesn't surprise me. This is what I had been talking about and anticipating. And then we've now since subsequently gotten the pullback. You can see Friday after that jobs number, I think it became evident to everyone that the Fed is back on the sidelines. I've been saying that for quite some time. But we had a gap below the range and a gap and go. Um, Short term, again, a little bit oversold again. We're getting into some important Fibonacci levels, particularly the 61.8 of this range. It would not surprise me to see this come down a little bit further. I think if this is going to bottom, it's going to have to at least kind of have a sort of a double bottom or maybe a higher low. So we'll see where that comes in. However, um, I, I didn't believe that this dollar rally was going to be sustainable for a multitude of reasons, and I'm gonna get into them shortly. But what you need to know, in my view, is that we are below the range. I've said that that move is usually unsustainable. I would not be initially initiating you know, a ginormous positions on short the dollar, but I do believe you can remain short as long as we are below the high of day here. There could be multiple days of continuation. I believe that will be the case the bonds. This is really where the rubber meets the road. This is this is the Fed. Um, let me give you a bigger term perspective of where we are in terms of this. You can see this longer term chart. This was the end of the world, of course, 2009, the uh, the crash. And since then, there had been, you know, a very large pullback in bonds. There had been a rising in rates. 
and we are now way up above this high. You can see we've spent quite some time up here. I, I think it's because of this. The economic data has just been awful, and not just in the United States. It's been pretty crappy globally, and I think that because the countries in the Eurozone, in Asia, in the Middle East, these, they don't necessarily, their banks don't necessarily have FDIC insurance like the United States does. And wealthy people abroad need a place to park their money. They're, you know, when, when they get worried, they want a return of their capital, not necessarily a return on their capital, and they need deep liquid markets to, um, to park their money, and they need to be able to buy and sell without moving the price on themselves. And there is no bigger market than the treasury, the bond market, the treasury market. That's, I believe, why this has remained so stubbornly strong. Also, consequently, why some of the dollar strength has existed. People have been selling euros, selling whatevers, and buying dollars to fund their treasury purchases. Anyhow, um, I talked about this double bottom here. We held the lower end of range. Friday was a gap and go up above this little bit of a downtrend. We do have some reference resistance up here coming in and trend resistance. So I don't necessarily know that this is just going to completely take off. I believe this is like below 1.7%. So it is quite low in terms of the bonds. I am expecting um, this to hold, excuse me, hold firm though for a few reasons. One um, being that I don't believe the Fed is going to be raising rates for a while. I want to show you on this, this is the uh, the CME website where they post the probabilities of the Fed raising rates. I had talked about this a while back. We had had similar numbers. They weren't quite this low, but they were single digits. And I said that the um, Fed had been way overly priced out of the market, and I had expected there to be some type of a, a, I guess, mean reversion. I thought we would see a little bit of a move back up, and it did. It went quite far, a little bit dramatic at times, and I think they it had just gotten so lopsided that it needed a snapback, and the snapback got way overdone, and I think people really started believing the Fed was going to raise rates. This now has been alleviated, this pressure, given the jobs numbers from Friday, which we'll get into in a moment. But more importantly, we're down to 4% for the June meeting. July is down to 31%, September 48%, November 49%, and as I've said all along, I think that uh, December is basically a uh, fed accompli that we will be seeing a rate hike in December. I was not thinking, given the data that we've seen, that the Fed really was in a position to, uh, to move ahead of time. There, there are many new members of the Fed who um, I don't want to call any names out, but um, maybe I will at some point. I often do on the stream, but it, it's really irrelevant which is which. But they've all basically done a good job of discrediting themselves now. All of this June is live and the data is improving and so on and so forth. I think has proven that other than Janet Yellen, who in her last meeting was fairly dovish. Um, that was really back when I had turned from being more cautious to maybe a little bit more in the sell the rally mode to back to being to buy the dip mode. And I said that her her conversation was, I, she hit every point I really wanted to hear. Um, she talked about worrying about the dollar strength. She talked about needing a low interest rate environment. She had gra downgraded the global outlook. And she had said the risks were to the downside. I don't necessarily know if the TV talking heads or you know traders really understood what Yellen was saying, and you don't just go from being downgrading the risks to being down to raising rates. First, I believe she would need to go from the risks being to the downside to the risks being now more neutral, you know, going from negative to raising without with often skipping that neutral. It, to me, it just made no sense, and I was never in the camp that I thought Yellen and the Fed and company would really be raising based if, you know, if they truly are data dependent. They talked about this gradual pace of gradualism. I mean, just all the languages, it would have been just wrong for them to go at this point. And um, if you take a look at these jobs numbers, they have now cemented the fact that the jobs market 
is really weakening. I don't want to get too into the data, but uh, like for example, GDP is very weak. I mean, we're we're barely struggling to hold on to like a two percent economy. The ISMs in both the manufacturing and service have been quite weak. They've been in a decline mode. PMI, the same thing. We had a bit of a quote unquote hot durable goods number. But if you took out commercial aircraft there, the gain was like 0.4% rather than like the 3% gain. So I think that that could have been just a restocking issue or basically, you know, it's Boeing unique. It's not necessarily a great read on the economy. But these numbers here, I'm going to I'm gonna kind of unpack them a little bit for you. I want to show you what's important. This number here, the prior reading of the non-farm payroll of 160,000 jobs, was actually a huge miss because they had been talking about 200,000 jobs. And this 160,000 was revised down to 123. I believe the prior reading before that had also been now revised down. The consensus this read was 158,000 below, notice, below the miss number. And we only came in at 38,000. That is a really, really dramatic decline and a huge miss. I mean, like if this, this is the kind of stuff when you miss, um, like if you were a company and your earnings were supposed to be, let's say, 158000 and you came in at 38000 you'd wake up next morning and your stock being down 30%, in my view. It would be that, – it's, it's really that quite uh, – that large of a miss. This coming week, um, we are a little bit free of economic data. However, the, there are a couple of events here I want to show you. The JOLTS number gives some more context and color to that jobs number. That's going to be important. It's only a um, – yellow or orange starred event here, but I believe it's going to have a lot more importance and significance this time around given the crappy data we got on on Friday. Um, the, and of course, the, uh, the oil report. That's very important. So that's what's going on in terms of the, uh, in terms of the data. So we covered our, um, you know, our, a bit of our Fed here. Um, Yellen is speaking this week. I would be, I believe, I'm curious to see what she has to say given the, uh, the the dismal outlook in jobs. But, you know, everyone the prior week had said, oh, she sounded hawkish. I said I thought she had sounded pretty dovish. So I guess, uh, I guess that's really how it played out. Speaking of oil, oh, um, one last thing with regard to the uh, TLT. You know, people don't seem to understand this. This is really the key. This is why the market is, has been quite actually resilient and strong, if you will. It's because of this. Stocks in a normal environment are very sensitive to interest rates. They are even more sensitive in a quantitative easing world or a ZERP world, if you will. P multiple premium. So the market is currently trading at roughly around 19 times earnings. Um, when the market gets below 10 times earnings, it's unsustainable to the downside. Usually when you get up close to about 20 times earnings, that seems to usually be the top. And I think that's why you have a lot of people who are bearish. The one caveat that they always leave out is that when markets peak, 1929, 1987, I believe, although I have to check that number, um, 100% in 2000 and, 2000 and again in 2007, the market peak when interest rates were 6%. We are a long way from home, Toto. The interest rates now, as we know, are struggling to even get hold close to 2%. That to me means the market, even these dismal, some of these, in some cases, dismal earnings or stable earnings, are given a PE multiple premium because they become the only game in town. Try going to your bank and getting CDs, buying treasuries here. You know, you're not going to sustain your account, um, you know, your lifestyle with, you know, two sub 2% 2 um, treasury yields. Most people want to get 5 or 6%. And once that happens in the treasury market, it becomes a very, very attractive alternative to the stock market and money flows into bonds and it comes cascading out of the stock market. We are seeing the inverse if, of that, if you will, sort of the bizarro land. There are a lot of people who are very idealistic and very dogmatic, and they usually tend to be on the bear side. They have been incorrect for quite some time. You have to understand the game that the market is playing at any given point. They will be right at some point. There will be a day of reckoning. But I often talk about the game of musical chairs. The music can go longer than you think, and the ability to kind of 
play against that is very difficult. Uh, the market doesn't have a lot, really very much excess in it. I'll get into that in a few minutes when I discuss the S&P. But um, just keep that in mind, the PE multiple premium because of low interest rates. If you're interested in this, I often talk about the weighted average cost of capital, WAC. It basically means it is a large part of it is determined by the risk-free rate, which is the Fed Treasury rates. And the lower those go is the kind of the end product turns out better. That is what um, stocks and projects are discounted on. And that is this is why the market is remaining as remote as resilient as it is oil oil is an important one we have gotten up to some reference areas here I talked about 49s being some resistance and I often talk about when we get to a resistance point is the back off sharp steep or kind of middling and mild I would say that this is more middling and mild. Look at all these hammers. It's been rather um, resilient. It's held in pretty well, even given some bad data. Um, I think that that is sort of healthy-ish. I, I, would, I would be more of a, uh, I, I had been long some levered ETF at the time, uh, UWTI, I believe, and I had sold it into here. I'd be looking to rebuy on a test of the channel or maybe even the 50-day. Look, when this kind of broke out of the 50-day, that's really when the magic kind of happened. I'd be an interested buyer back near the 50 if there was a pullback or if there's more sideways consolidation, I think we can go up and test 52s. Longer term, I think we can get up to the 665, 75 area, but that is way, way further out. Um, I don't even want to talk about that now because it's, it's, it's sort of fanciful. It's just not going to happen at the moment. At this level, a lot of these companies that have been insolvent when oil was down here are probably hedging up their books a bit and selling forward futures. And yeah, that's going to be a little bit of pressure on oil in the meantime. When we get into reference resistance, you know, there's usually a little bit of a responsive um, selling. So that's my view on oil. XLE is confirming this. It would help if I could type properly. Um, made a high here, had a bit of a pullback. Couldn't even get the test of the 50 and the 200. 50 now is crossed through the 200. That's your golden cross, if you will. We're basically futzing around here on the 10-day and the 20-day. Um, we have a bit of a lower high here, but it is really just in the context of, um, I mean, from here. But we do have some higher highs here on this leg. So this to me is really just still consolidation. The trend, if you will, is still higher. We haven't had a trend touch in a while. I would be a uh, you know a buyer on trend. I think a, a any test of the 200 or the somewhere between the 50 and the 200 is a uh, is a buy in my view. Uh, Exxon also confirming a kind of robust uh, buying. I had said that the channel low here would be a good area to buy, but look at the days they try to sell Exxon off, right? You had this move down here, basically closed up near the day, day's highs, same thing here with a hammer, and then we have a bit of a doji here. So there hasn't been like, you know, amphalotic selling. I would say, still say that this is just, I mean, yeah, that we kind of are breaking the consolidation range, but it's not really getting like this type of steep selling. Um, it's holding up rather strong, which is quite telling. Again, another one I would be an interested buyer on for the row row play near the channel. If we could get even down as low here to retest the kind of breakout area, I'd be a put seller. I'll probably start out light here and then get a little more heavy as we get into this, if we get into that region, I should say. We may not. China. You got to have your China. Um, we are still in a downtrend. Uh, this got into some reference areas. We didn't quite get the 61.8 touch that I had been looking for. We missed it just a little bit. We are challenging this region. Um, I like the price action here a bit. It's um, kind of just consolidating a little bit under the trend. Let's see what happens. You're either going to get, I think, a rather a, a move down, or we're going to, you know, finally bust out of the um, the downtrend, the malaise here, and maybe get a bit of a, a rally back up into the um, into the 36s. The um, Good news for bulls here is that the low is a little higher. The bad news is we haven't confirmed with a higher high yet to show that the pattern has fully turned. 
the uh, risk, of course, here is that, you know, this just is a, a, a throwback to trend and that it resumes the move down. I'm waiting to see the trend snap. I'm waiting to see the 200 MA get taken, which is an important distribution level you can see in the volume profile. And then I'd like to see this, um, this high here up here taken. And then I would say that the uh, trend has then changed. Uh, Baba. Uh, so a lot of people love this Baba. Um, I'm less enthralled with it. I'll, I'll tell you why. You have a lot of false moves here. Like, check this out. This here was technically a breakout. The next day, you had a gap and basically crap lower. You held um, on the close this area, but you did take the range out. The next day was a gap up. And you had two days of huge continuation. And then, of course, we know SoftBank announced that they were selling. So you had a, a false breakout here, another false breakout, and then a breakdown. Um, this bar to me was quite telling. I said that this was day one of a breakdown. I was really surprised when it got taken back. Um, and this now, to me, is, is quite nasty. I would think here you probably flushed out a lot of longs, sucked in a lot of shorts, squeezed the shorts, sucked in a lot of longs again, and now you're back down. I do not like this stock as long as it's below 77.77. You have a two-day high here at 77.75 to 77.80. If you want to play short, you can use these two-day highs. I mean, you do have a bit of a hammer here. Um, I would use the two-day high as a stop if you're short. And if you want to play long, you can play long back up over these two-day highs. I'm really not a fan of this stock. I think there's better places to kind of um, cut your teeth make some bucks. I would be an interested buyer down near trend again. I don't necessarily think that that's going to be the case, but I'm not a huge fan of the BABA. When things, um, when things get complicated, I just choose to go where things are less complicated. IBB, we're starting for the first time in a little while to make some higher lows and some higher highs. That's uh, rather encouraging. This moved up quite dramatically. Um, this is the real key level, though, 275.40 to 271.77. As long as we're above there, I am inclined to play these stocks a little long. If we get back below there, we should resume the downward move. It would not be pretty. I've played this via Alkermes. I've liked this stock since the lows. I, I'll tell you, truth be told, I had been I've been watching this stock, eyeing this stock for really quite some time, and I never really got in it. I always felt like I missed it, and then this opportunity happened, and I knew that it would be an opportunity, but I needed to see a confirmation of a low, and it didn't happen right away. We had, you have to spend a little time. When you get this big of a move down and then a gap down, I mean, there's so many disappointed people. It takes a little while, but here we got it. Um, you had a an excess low, bookended by two higher lows. I'm going to talk about this in the ES in a little while. Once you clear an excess low day of high when you have a kind of quote-unquote secure low, it's a long over that high of day, and then I usually use the pullback low as a stop. So it kept on really going. I mean, higher lows, higher highs. You're in well into the gap. Anything above 4028 to me is still bullish. The pullback Friday just held the 10-day moving average. I'm looking to kind of get, you had a little bit of excess here. I think that, you know, you got to a, a key Fibonacci level, 38.2. It's just kind of pulling back. I wouldn't be surprised to see this fill the gap, you know, maybe get to the 50, at least maybe the 50%. That's sort of where the next volume distribution is. You could see there's a big gap in here. Um, but we did get the 38.2. You got to always respect that. After you've had a really large move down, the 38.2 is often where the rally stops. But the pullback here has been kind of muted. So I would think that this can come down maybe a little bit more, but I'm still in buy the dip mode with Alchemies. The um, other one um, I like, it's a really well run company, is Gilead. Uh, you had a bit of a of, of look below and fail. You can see here you had a bit of a, a, a low. Then you had some consolidation here. This day was a look below and it, it, it failed. And we rallied back up and now it looks like it's forming a bit of an inverse head and shoulders here. We'll see how that plays out. If you're long, you can use this uh, basically 8505 or 8505 to 8488. Excuse me. Anything above there, I think you could still be long. 
back below to me gets a little bit more iffy. You don't really, uh, this rally hasn't been all that impressive, but it has been consolidating. You've got some time in terms of the um, stochastics that we haven't really gotten back overbought yet. I would think that we um, retest some of these Fibonacci levels. I'm really looking for a 50% Fib, given that that would be a test close to the gap. 92, that's where the volume distribution kind of ends. So that's what I'm looking for in uh, Gilead. Very cheap stock based on earnings, but I've often talked about the peak earnings thesis with this, with regulations coming. So don't let that fool you. Um, often stocks that are seem expensive at cycle lows are really cheap because the earnings prospects are about to get better. And often stocks like these that seem cheap get expensive because they're at um, cyclical peaks. Always remember that. It's really, um, it, it, it's not always the easiest thing to understand, but it is important. Um, getting into um, backtracking a little bit here, some other risk measures. The um, HYG, this was also a bit of a tell for me that things were looking better. You know, for bears to get what they're looking for, you know, the big day of reckoning, the crash, you really need this. And this is what I think spooked Yellen the last time around. You need a credit, you know, problems in credit. We've been rallying. Um, credit has been improving here, I believe, because oil has improved. You've seen the um, distress, this distress companies. Yes, you've had some bankruptcies, Lynn Energy and stuff, but those are really just poorly managed companies that made a lot of stupid mistakes. But HYG, look, the 200 was a bit of a problem for a while. We've um, gotten back over and held. It's just been consolidating. There's really no credit crisis um, in my view here at this point. Um, I think that as long as this kind of holds in, um, things are, uh, I guess, a little okay. They're uh, kind of okay. So that's my view. I, I look for something like this. If you start seeing this type of movement, then you know you might get a little bit more uh, more nervous. But I would really not get too concerned until the 50 MA, and then maybe this swing low gets taken at 82.20. I would say that uh, HYG is, is an important tell. I know a lot of people aren't into trading HYG, but is important nonetheless. Um, here we go. This is also a key risk measure, um, the emerging markets. This is sort of your, um, I don't know if this quite characterizes frontier markets, but you do have a bit of a, um, a pennant forming here and potentially an inverse head and shoulders that I'm seeing. Um, it's not exactly the cleanest pattern. The neckline is slanted. Um, I will say this, though. This is a risk on measure. This, to me, looks like you had a, a breakdown, a retest, and it's now a false breakdown. Look at this. You had an island reversal low, a gap low, kind of this doji, and then a, a gap up. I'll tell you this, I've, in my experience, I've often missed these, and I sometimes knowingly do it. I don't make that mistake much these days anymore. When I see moves like this, look where the reference lows are. You had a gap down, a gap up. After you have this gap, these, this is a buy, a right or right out buy, particularly if the gap isn't too huge. I mean, if you gapped up here, yeah, I understand you missed it. But look what you did. You've taken back now all of this down move. You had this move up, and on Friday, you had a gap and go above the 50 MA and back over the trend line into the gap. This, to me, is a really big tell. I think you can easily see the downtrend line. Um, if you want to play right or right or right out with the EEM, you know, I, I prefer to buy a little bit of a little bit of weakness. I mean, this hasn't moved tremendously, but you know, we are getting close to the gap fill. I would I would really wait on this, see how the gap fill plays. If it's a big back off or if it's just one of those like sort of sideways ones, if it's a sideways one, I'd be interested in playing it more. If you want to be right, you know, if you're already in this or you want to play immediately, use Friday's range. Above the high is still a long. Below the low is a um, maybe a little bit of a GTFO. So let's get to the markets. Um, we've teased enough, right? All righty. So here's the story. Um, you had this move down. You had this big kind of like rounded top looking move. You had this disgusting move lower, a higher low, a move back into range. So this is normal. This is a check back. What should not have happened here if the market was to remain bullish is this. This to me is looking more like a, a bear market play. And you had had lower highs and you came back down and retest and even overshot the lows. Um, you basically had a double low here. This is um, slightly higher, which is always a good sign. But this really shouldn't have been retaken if the market was to remain bullish. 
Um, this move should have been, you know, I guess expected. There's always a throwback after sort of a crash, and then it usually resumes lower. The difference this time was that we came back up here. You really should not have been back up quite this high if the market was to remain bearish. Um, this is really was the Yellen day, the game kind of the um, game changer day. I want to discuss what happened here. There are some important levels, and I often talk about top the Top Gun example that I always I never leave my wingman, I never leave my levels. So, for the market to be in trouble, you need closes, particularly on Fridays below 204.12. You see here we had it, and then you had the, the flash crash. Again, here, um, you had a close below 204.12. You had the gap down. They tried to hold the rally. It failed at the next kind of what should have been support and then cascaded lower. Look here. This is really, really the essence of what's going on. You had the Yellen day, the gap, and the market was not all that convinced here. It, was, it took some time to digest. I think you, again, have like these very dogmatic bears, and they were trying to sell off the market they didn't quite believe it but the day the days up here had stronger breaths to the upside than the days down like these days down which sort of opened at the highs and closed at the lows which is usually quite a bearish sign had positive breath or like one or two to one negative days these weren't like trend days yellen made the difference we rallied up i told you here um that i thought we would get to 210.11. We got to two, two, I mean, between 210 and 211, we got to 210.92. So exactly, and I said that this was the place to lighten up. I also said that we needed to see if we got one of these, the steep pullbacks, or if it was just more of a mild pullback. The pullback wound up being more of the mild variety. It wound up coming back down to retest the 204.12. But look what happened. All tests there basically held. We had a look below and fail. When you have a look below and fail with a hammer and you gap the next day, that is almost always a buy. So let's, dis let's unpack here exactly my thinking. So everyone knows that there was the head and shoulders pattern, right? The difference in this pattern, and I talked about this, was that it was nuanced. Everybody knew it was raining, right? That doesn't help. Was it a summer shower? Was it a Category 1 hurricane? Was it a Category 5 hurricane that we were going to, you know, get the, you know, everyone always seems to think that when we get to like a market inflection point that it's going to be 2008 and 2009 again. There wasn't really any euphoria here. Everyone I was watching thought it was a top, was playing for a top, thought it, you know, were counting the points for the head and shoulders move down. It is very rare in my experience, I don't think I've ever experienced it, where everybody knew it was the top, where it's all short and ready to go. It just doesn't happen like that. You usually get caught in a gap like this, and then it continues. That's really how market tops happen. They don't aren't predictable, so predictable like this. It doesn't let everyone in. It kind of lets nobody in, and it forces people who are caught up long to puke it out. So that's what I was thinking, first of all, that it was too recognizable. Everyone kind of knew it. Also, this move here should not have taken place. Look at this. This was granted it was only one day, but it was sort of a leg. And this high eclipsed this high. You had a right shoulder that was higher than a left shoulder. That is significant. That's not when you get head and shoulder top breaks downs. Like, look at IBB, for example. This was one I was really on board with. A head and shoulders, you know, this I thought was a, a very textbook head and shoulders breakdown. This high and this, I mean, this was granted, this was a little bit higher, but it wasn't a lot higher. You had a neckline test, a, a very severe breakdown. This was the flash crash, so I think it got a little bit more. If you X this day out, though, look where it stopped. Really, this is where it, it should have. You had the throwback, check back, and then the resumption of the crash. That is, so, that is really how it plays out. Spy, on the other hand, let's zoom back in didn't really have that. You were well up into the range, almost up into the head, and the selling here wasn't very characteristic of, you know, crash mode. It just it just wasn't. 
So once you had the look below and fail, you got the resumption back up. So that's what happened. Where are we now? That's really what matters. So we're at a very precarious time in the market. We are at June, uh, the June um, m month of June, and it's also quarter end. March and June; those are the um, first end, end of the first quarter and the end of the second quarter. There are two likely scenarios I see here playing out in June. And I had said in last weekend's video that we were at a precarious time here, and I wasn't sure, I'm still not sure which one of these two are going to play out, but I will say how I will be playing it. Either we are going to get a bit of a sell-off early in June, and then a rally for quarter's end, um, which will be the window dressing. Be very careful with that rally. It will likely suck in a lot of longs, and it could get uglier for, toward the end, end part of the summer. Or we get a rally ahead of then and then a bit of a lock-in in the end of June and the market comes back down a bit. Those are the two likely scenarios that I see happening. How do we know which? The answer is, is that we won't until it happens, sort of. I will say this. We are above 208.97, which is an old reference high. You can see moves above there have been unsustainable in the past. I say this, as long as we are above here, I will say that the play is still long. You have a lot of moving average support just below here, and you're right, still above the 10-day. You had the junky jobs numbers, which was a bit of a look below, again, below and fail. Look where it stopped at 208.86. Um, I will say this, that is rather encouraging. It's actually starting to look a lot like kind of this play, right? Look at this. We're up here. We moved up. We broke We broke the head and shoulders. That pattern is gone now, just so you know. I'm going to delete it because it's it's no longer valid. It is completely irre irrevocably busted. There is no head and shoulders. Once you take out a right shoulder high, the pattern is negated. We are now slightly above. We t this day is significant. The high was 210.93. The high here was 210.92, so we now have taken out the head. We have a new higher high for the first time since the all-time high. I want to show you. Look at this. Um, all right, look. We had this high. We had this high. This high was slightly lower. This high was still slightly lower. This high was still slightly lower. This high was basically equal, and now we have eclipsed it by a smidgen. Um, not very convincing, granted, but it is um, it is still a higher high in the range. That is very, very important. As long, I will say this, as we hold 207.97, basically I had 207.84 here put off. If we start getting below there, I'm going to be a lot more cautious in the market, but as long as we're above this like 207.84 to 208.97 area, I think that the play is still long. You have moving averages that are very quickly catching up. You have 100 and 200, which are much lower, but they are now starting to, this one's flattening, and this one's even starting to bend. You have a 50 roughly near this um, reference range support, which is quickly moving up, 20 moving up, and above the 10. You have now, let's basically say, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven days of trade in this range. If you start losing the bodies of these days and get below, I will think that we're going to see a 50 MA test. That is my that is sort of my view. As long as this holds, though, and the more time we spend up here, the more consolidation we get. Yes, it's a market getting longer and longer, but it's also a market working off excess by time. Look what happened here. We just had a correction. This is a market correction. Um, we're now back up to those highs. So it's spending a lot of time up here. There's a saying, you know, you don't always get this much time to sell the highs. It seems more and more likely to me that we are going to bust through and see a new all-time high. If the Fed is on the whole, on hold, we know that we have some Brexit issues or whatever, but as long as we know the Fed, remember what I said about the interest rates, as long as we have a benign Fed, the probability of a new all-time high is more and more increasingly likely. Um, the probability of a blow off top becomes more and more increasingly likely. I want to show you this. This is also very key. I got a lot of questions this week, by the way, from people asking how to draw, where to draw Fibonacci levels from. The day, the daily charts 
are often tough. I like using weeklies. If you, um, it makes it more clear, particularly when you're a bit of a noob. Um, that's not to be derogatory to everyone. Listen, everyone had to start somewhere. You don't start playing chess and you're a grandmaster the first day. You know, you don't start karate. You're a white belt. Everyone's a white belt when they start. They don't start out with a black belt. It's not like the Matrix where you can download Kung Fu and know it in three seconds. It just doesn't work like that. Um, I, this is something that I often do. It's very helpful. I would start out on weeklies or even monthlies. It's often more clear than the dailies. Take a look at this daily pattern, though. You had the look below and fail, a bit of a doji, and then this wasn't quite a Marabozo candle because there is a little bit of a tail, but you have a big, big week up that took back one, two, three, four weeks worth of trade, almost five um, or six here, even if you, if you, you know, don't count the top, but basically well into that range. And then this week was a pullback and then close at the high. Look where we closed here, uh, 210.28. The close here was 210.24. So we closed a consolidation week above the high of the prior. That is pretty bullish pattern. That to me suggests higher. If you're a long spy and you want to use the weekly, you can use the low of that bar, the 208.86. Look where that is. It's right below the um, this reference range. So if you want to play long, I mean, it would not surprise me, I'll tell you, I've seen this happen many times before, where you have like two or three weeks of consolidation. You kind of have the one bar up, the three bars down, and then the resumption of the move back up. But if you are short term um, and you want to play that way, Use this bar here um, as your as your reference range. It's it's a consolidation bar. I will be just using um, basically the halfway point of that mark, um, the 207.97 um, to 207.84. Anything below there, I will get more bearish or neutral, I should say. Um, anything above there, I'll remain more bullish. That's just those are the levels. I'll stick to them. I talked about secure lows. Um, oh, this is my. Um, my war room, so to speak. You have the uh, ES 15 minute, the ES 5 minute, the breath. Um, the ticker for that is VOLD. And then I have a proprietary um, script in here that gives me the reading. The one When I say 1 to 1 negative or 2 to 1 negative for the NICE and the NASDAQ, this is where I get it from. This is the advanced decline lines. My ticks, um, this is NICE ticks. If you want to look at the ticks on the NASDAQ, you could do tick Q. And then I keep the VIX. So this is what I look at pretty much all day long. Um, let's talk secure low. So you had this, um, this was the jobs number, the gap down, the move down. And then when you lose the kind of after hours or pre-market low, people play for the to the short side. Look what happened here. You had a low, a lower low with a tail excess book end, so you have this low book ended by two basically equal lows once you moved over the high of day of this bar or I shouldn't say the high of day but the high of this bar the 20 2087 quarter it was a long right for a right or right out trade once this bar was um, basically formed so you had a bit of a look back in a move up and then we never looked back this is a secure low play if you invert the charts this could be a secure high play. Like you come up, have a little excess. The next bar is a low, uh, you know, a um, basically a lower high. And then once you take out the low of that bar, you know, it would have been it would have been the fade short. So when I say secure low, this is really what I'm looking at. So you have the secure low on that bar. You move back into the prior day's range. So this was also a look below and fail. Once you moved into the prior day's range, you got back into value. It was, um, you know, kind of not a good situation for the for the bears. Um, we didn't quite get back up above the after after hours or the pre market high, but we did close quite well. Usually, and I'll say this is why I also favor kind of the um, a bit to more to the long side is that the high of the move happened here non regular trading hours. Usually, a high of a move for it to be secure and a good move has to be during regular trading hours. So it's would be rare in my in my experience for a high to have taken place in non RTH hours. So that to me also favors the uh, the bull case. IWM. We are we're on the we still on the weeklies. Let's get back into the uh, the dailies. But I'd like to do a longer time frame. Let's do a uh, 
yearly. All right, so we are back into the box. That box low was very key. You can see we had a look below, a, a look in and fail, but the fail wasn't, again, dramatic. It was just kind of a gent more gentle pullback. We are now well into that area. I will say as long as we are in that area, and you can see we have these multiple days of consolidation, if we're above these lows, the play is still long. If we get back below this box low, which is... 114.29, I would be less inclined to be long. The good news is, though, is that we have higher lows and now higher highs. So the pattern to me, and you also have broken the downtrend. Um, I would really be still looking to play BTD by the dip in this as long as that pattern plays out. But um, those are my levels. I will stick to them. The Qs, I talked about this. These, the bears were going to have a hard time if they couldn't break the 104 to 105. They held. We've moved up. We've been just chugging along. As long as you're above the 109.38, I think that you can still be long. I really like playing this. Um, you had this prior downtrend. I think as long as you're on the right side of this regression line, it's still kind of okay. Um, yeah, you can see that this was really the upper, upper distribution. As long as we're above that area, I am still, you know, in favor of the long trade. Um, back below it, you might be a little bit more cautious, but again, 50 MA is pretty close, 20 MA pretty close. This backside here isn't all that far, so that's what I'm looking at. Apple. Here's a little bit of a trade school. Wow, this chart looks really convoluted, but Apple often likes to be like that. So I'll talk about what happened here. You had a false break of the downtrend multiple days up here. You had this Nikkei report saying that they were going to miss. You had a, a basically an open and a close on the low um, gap down. And then we've just been falling and falling. Another, you know, the earnings, I guess, here were not considered so great. Again, a gap down and then a kind of, you started to find buyers down near the reference low, the flash crash low of 92. And then you had this move, this consolidation. Everyone here, I, I think, um, I, I don't even know how many people were talking to me about shorting Apple, but quite a few. I talked about Apple being, there were two ways to play it here. Um, one was, yes, you could play a right or right out short below 92, but I said I was at this point because we had already moved down. This is, the, again, the context. Remember when I talked about the summer shower, the Category 1 or Category 5 hurricane? You came from 112 down to 92 and now first breaking. The stock had already come down huge, ginormous. I said I was looking now to play long either on a false breakdown, a move over the high of day of this bar, or a move down closer to the 61.8, down near 85, and the trend. Look what happened. You had the false breakdown. You had this sort of crappy doji bar then you had a, a basically a gap move up and go because everyone here was wrong you know they had b basically been pressing the lows shorting and the stock moved back up we got back to 100.7 basically just shy yeah i'm sorry we got just to it 100.73 so we did get it i talked about this being an area to lighten up um, we and it was also a 50% fib consolidated and then here broke the trend and had a gap down and it's just been futzing around holding. You had Goldman Sachs, I believe, downgraded here. Um, it did hold the 96.69 with a slight move below. Um, if you're still long, you could use the 96.69 as a stop or whatever. The, I'm sorry, this low 96.63. Anything below there, I, I think we're going to come back in. I had said in last weekend's review that I was expecting a pullback. I would be more interested in getting back long here closer to the 95.10 um, to 93.77 level. Those are the 50 and 61.8% fibs of the range. Uh, I would be a put seller or a row row stock, right or right out stock buyer down there. Um, I eventually do think we will fill this gap to 103.74, but... 
the fact that we are back below, that we kind of had a look into the gap and fail, that's very typical. It doesn't mean that the stock is overly bearish here, but it, it, it is very typical. We got one of my levels. We're get, now we need to see if the pullback is gentle or mild. You have a hammer to trade against. If you want to be long, you can be long over the high of day of that, which is 97.84 or short below 96.63. Keep it simple, stupid. That's the way uh, the money is made, right? Facebook. Um, this spike here, I believe, never happened. If it did, I would be all over it like, I don't know, white on rice. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, because we would have gotten to my, uh, to my level here. Um, we didn't yet. However, I will say this. Uh, the stock has been holding up really well. Um, look what happened here. We had these consolidations. These tend to resolve lower with moves to the 200-day moving average and then resumptions to the upside. I don't necessarily know how we're getting here so quickly, but could be an overall market correction. We do have a gap fill level here, um, 108.89, and then the... Um, 200 is down near 184. You can see it's been rock solid support. Even the flash crash day couldn't close below there. Um, you had a look below here again to trend, which still closed the body above there. The pullback low is basically to there. I would be waiting on that. Um, the 50 MA, by the way, more short term is also very key. If you're long, just play long against um, the the one. Sorry, the um, the 50 MA. We are still trapped inside of this bar. I had people ask me how I'd play this. I said to do strangles. That has worked spectacularly. We're now a little further along down the road in that. Um, I'm expecting this chop to continue a little while. Longer term, the you can see the moves to the wrong side of the progression line have been met with selling. Here we got like right to it on another daily chart. We actually, um, I think, actually got through it, but we're basically there. Um, I think this also was a touch on a different chart. It's weird. I don't know. These charts get a little goofy sometimes, but um, I, that's, that's my story with it. I eventually think we're going to see 130. I just don't know that we don't get the gap fill and a trend touch first, but it may just consolidate and then, uh, then go. The story in um, Facebook is still very... Uh, we do also, by the way, have the stochastics sort of going against us here, which you know, it can take a little bit of time to, uh, to to even out. You can see here it was a little gentle for a while, then we got the move low. I, I like Facebook longer term. I like their prospects. They're growing their revenues and their bottom line faster than Google at this point. There's a shift from, there was originally a shift from paper, you know, print advertising to online, and now that is shifting into mobile and social. Facebook is at the vanguard of that area. They have done the best in terms of monetizing they're mobile. Um, I don't see that changing anytime soon. I think that Facebook is a long-term play, but you can be opportunistic with it. I have never seen more people trying to pick tops in stocks than in Amazon. Um, I get a lot of conversations from people asking if it's a short, when is it a short, when is it a peak? The answer is this, is that, there, that I, I, this is how I trade. I trade along the line of least resistance, meaning if a stock is making higher lows and higher highs, I buy the dip. If a stock is making lower highs and lower lows, that's when I'm looking to short the rips. We also have an up tape. You, if, you have a, if you have a bad tape and you have a bad stock, that's when you get aggressive on the short side. If you have a sideways to up tape and an up stock, you want to kind of, I mean, yeah, there's money to be played. You know, if you were short here, you know, you made some money, but I mean, the stock just made a new high here. I think that this will have a pullback at some point. Seasonally, this is not great timing for the stock. I would definitely book some profits, but I'm not outright shorting Amazon here. I want to see the pattern change first. What you'd want to see here, for example, if you were to get short Amazon, a move down here, a rally to a lower high, and then he, then take these lows. That, to me, would signal a pattern change. What happened here? You made a low and now made a higher high. The pattern has not shifted yet. Very careful. I would, If you want to play short, wait for some down days and play some put, put ratios or put spreads. That, to me, is the really the only way to play it. I am looking to still buy the dip in Amazon, but lower. Netflix, um, this has been a really raunchy stock, so to speak. It's had a lot of false dawns and 
it, it basically got to where I said I thought we would see um, near the downtrend line. I thought we would see 103.88. The high of this move was 104. So we were basically there. I think I said 103.88 to 105, actually. So we got close. We're getting a bit of a, a pullback. Longer term, I, I like kind of like Netflix, but we have a higher low. I, I do think this gap fills um, at some point. That would be a trend snap. But until we, I don't anticipate, I wait to see. Uh, no hurry to be in Netflix here until you get a, um, a a snap of the trend. A snap of the trend would mean a higher low and a higher high on the leg, and that to me would signal that the game is back on in a, in Netflix. Until that happens, though, um, you know it's probably going to be relegated in a range, and you might get a move down here. I like playing put ratios. The breakout of this range was 93.22 ish. If you want to play, you know, long some puts here and then short two time two times out of the money mid range here, like in the 90s, be my guest. I like that as a play. Google, I don't like to mess with when it's in range. I probably shouldn't even bother talking about this, um, but I do see a setup here, which I will discuss momentarily. Um, I like to play it as a short against the channel high and then as a buy when it's near the channel low. Take a look here. Um, we didn't quite get down to the 680s, which is really where I was looking for a move, um, actually to play a row row long there. But we gapped down, had a um, forming a bit of a W here, and now potentially a cup and handle. You had a look into the gap here that failed. If it looks in again, I think there's a uh, quick quickie for a gap fill play. So above this um, 753.48, I would be playing row row long. If you're already long, just... I guess uh, stick to this program here, right? Um, I can't draw this trend in. It's too short of a time. It's going to be a pain. But just use these lows, you know, this candle. If you start getting too deep into here, you don't want to. So 200 MA. Let's keep it simple. If you start getting multiple closes below the 200 MA, you probably don't want to be long. Very simple. Tesla, um, they had a secondary. Um, at, I believe it was 215. By the way, I was the one um, who had talked about the 265 level. We did eclipse it shortly, but it was the sale consolidation. This is also like a little bit of um, a breakdown. Uh, we are now bound, we bounced off the 50% fib. I really was honestly looking for a move to the 61.8. I thought that would be a better low, but this was the range low and some reference areas. And it, it held. So you kind of have to just watch and wait a little here. Um, as long as this holds, though, 215, I think the play is long. If it gets back below the secondary of 215, you could try the row, row short. Again, keep it simple, stupid. Um, I don't like to play this stock too often because it's a really nosebleed high level dollar weight price stock. You know, you get a hundred, getting 100 point moves in this name is. Not too uncommon. It, it, you really have to play this through options. Um, you had a look into the gap, pullback, basically held range, and now back into the gap. Um, it's just probably going to fill. I would, uh, I would say that if you're as long as you're above uh, the one, sorry, twelve ninety twenty to twelve eighty ninety seven, you can play long. Back below there, I think you can play short. This would be, have been another false dawn, and you'll probably get and move back down to these lows. I'm going to keep it that simple. Expedia is sort of the um, poor man's price line, so to speak. Um, I actually think it's a better company at this point than Priceline for some various reasons. I'm running a little low on time, but it's basically how their listings come up. Um, Expedia doesn't include tax in the price like Priceline does, and they often come up as being cheaper. It's not necessarily always cheaper, but it's just great. They have a great they have a great site, a great app. I use it myself. I find it a lot more user friendly than Priceline. It, it's just better, um, in my personal opinion. Um, we do have a trend break. Uh, that is a little disconcerting. You have a hammer here to play against, which is basically a bit of a higher low than here. If you are above 109.99, so 110 and above to me would be a long. Below 108.37 is a short. Keep it simple, stupid. So I have had some requests. I guess I'm playing some requests, right? I'm DJing, so I'll do some requests. Um, all right, so you have a really weird picture here in this Chipotle. 
Uh, these lows are key. You have a lot of hammers down here. The stock looks like it's trying to bottom, but like, look, you had a breakdown here. This turned out to be a false breakdown with a move back up, and then it was taken back basically the next day. There are easier stocks to play. If Chipotle gets back above these hammers, the 254.24, I would say it's a long. If it's back below, it's a little iffy. You're still technically above the downtrend line. So you could use this bar's range. Anything above 444.54, try it row, row long. Anything below 433.10 is a right or right out short. Really simple. The other one of the request was gap stores. All right, so this got the 78.6. I think this thing yields like 5%. I don't know how safe that dividend is going to be. But again, look context. Gap down, consolidation, lows, gap down, move. They reported their earnings. Look at this. It's a bit, it's a bit of a professional gap. Look, you're above all of these consolidation days. The gap move wasn't that big. So let's keep it simple here. They reported, uh, everyone said, oh, okay, earnings. I thought they really weren't that great. Their comps were down 6%. When you have a gap up, this is a bit of a doji, um, you play the gap rules. Anything below the low, 1870 is iffy. You want to just GTFO. If you want to play this long, put a buy stop above 1943 and play long for the gap fill or a move to the 50 MA. That is actually how I'm going to play it. So if this moves back up above this high, I'll be long with a stop below the low. Very, very simple. Um, I think that covers what I, oh, one more thing. Um, Disney, I, I was short this stock. I am now basically flat. I'll t I played it short for earnings. Why? Um, you, ha you can see I have a lot of interest in this stock and the levels. Um, you had a move, once you have a move down like this and then you kind of slow cr rally back up, um, a gap fill. Everyone was really kind of bullish here. I played it short. Um, it gapped down. They tried to buy it a bit. Once you take the gap low, it, it usually goes lower. You got to this um, area here of consolidation, rallied back up. It couldn't hold over the 50 MA. I was talking about a close over the 50 MA being a, I would cover, I would have covered the short there. Um, here you go. You, you came down. You have a bit of a hammer here. The next day, a higher low with a hammer. I talked about covering the short if we get above basically 99 and above. That The high of the bar here was 98, 99. Here, in all intents and purposes, this to me, it, something was just not hitting right. I, I don't love how this stock is was trading. Um, it wasn't getting, you know, you have a hammer, the next day is a buy, and then here it even, it slightly eclipsed the lows. I actually wound up covering this at really well, basically on the low of the day, and it closed near the high. This to me just seems like it's destined for maybe, uh, my fear is a gap and go because everyone here is thinking breakdown and then it disappoints and you get a gap up and there's the gap fill. So I really was honestly looking for a move to the 94s where I was planning on flipping uh, long for a right or right out play, basically against these hammer lows here, the 93.23. But, and we still might get it. If you take out these three day lows and eclipse here, I'll be back short. I'll be playing short again. Um, probably covering some at 95.80 or whatever, and then, you know, doing what I said, flipping at 94, at, le at the very least selling out of the money puts. But this just, for some reason, it wasn't hitting right. It, it felt wrong. I, 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 te I tend to tell people if you don't really, if you're really learning how to trade, just spend some time reading the tape. Um, like I said, it would not surprise me to see some type of a gap of up and go here, and that could be, you know, it would make the trade a lot more difficult. So I'm basically, I covered it up. Anyhow, that's my story. I'm sticking to it for the weekend review. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm sorry we did go quite long with this. If you're not following me, follow me on Twitter. Please leave me some comments in the comment section below. Help me make the, um, broadcast better. If you liked it, hit the thumbs up bar and please subscribe to the channel. You will get notifications when I post new weekend review videos, Periscope rebroadcasts and special edition videos. Anyway, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. We'll have a great trading week and cheers.